Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. I'm Rob Fleming, uh, the Education Minister for the, for the Province of British Columbia, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Lekongan-speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I also want at the outset to acknowledge that today is the National Day of Mourning for working people in British Columbia and Canada, a day to remember and honour 140 BC workers who tragically lost their lives last year to workplace injury or disease. Uh, with me here today in the Press Theatre is the Deputy Minister of Education, Scott MacDonald, and the President of the BC School Trustees Association, Stephanie Higginson. We are, uh, inv we've invited you to join us today to provide you with an update on all the work that's happening in the K-12 education system to make sure that BC students and their families can continue their learning during this pandemic. This briefing is about an overview of all the things that are happening in BC school system. It is not an announcement about BC schools uh, reopening. After I provide an update, uh, Stephanie will make remarks on behalf of school trustees and then we will open it up to questions. I'm very grateful uh, for the dedication of everybody involved in BC's K-12 community, uh, specifically students, parents, support staff and educators, all essential as we navigate through this very difficult, unprecedented time together. The work we're seeing throughout BC and in our schools and in our homes is truly incredible given the circumstances and the hand that we've been dealt by this vicious pandemic. Here in BC, we're, in for, uh, we're fortunate to have partners in the K-12 education system who are dedicated to the needs of our students and families. As you'll recall, uh, we made a decision to suspend in-person classroom instruction on March the 17th, then under the direction of the provincial health officer to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Face-to-face instruction continues to be suspended for the majority of students in the province, although schools remain open for some students, including the children of essential service workers and those that are vulnerable and need more learning supports. All schools in BC, both public and independent, are operating under the guidelines established by the Provincial Health Officer and the Centre for Disease Control to ensure the safety of our students and education professionals. I'm proud of the incredible amount of work that has been done in the last five weeks to make sure our kids can keep learning. We've worked closely with all 60 school districts, independent school authorities, First Nation schools, teachers, school leaders, support staff, public health officials, and all our educa education partners on a coordinated approach. This work is led by our ministry integrated planning framework and guidelines developed by the ministry to support school districts and independent school authorities in their planning and delivery of educational opportunities and supports during this pandemic. These guidelines are continuously updated with new information, resources, and examples of best practices that are inspiring to one another no matter what part of the province we live in. The ministry also developed a teaching guide to help teachers as they educate our students in a very, very different way under these circumstances. And we have ensured teachers can connect with their students by video conferencing technology, providing access to a secure enterprise version of Zoom. We have onboarded to date more than 20,000 BC teachers who instruct more than 275,000 students with the Zoom Enterprise uh, video conferencing program. Other video conferencing platforms are being utilized in different parts of the province by the teaching workforce right across BC. For parents and educators, the ministry launched the Keep Learning website where families can access free learning resources to supplement schoolwork as well as have, uh, get, get tips on how to help children learn and how to ensure the well-being while they're at home. This site is very well utilized indeed and has seen more than 300,000 unique views since it was launched at the end of March. Our government knows that mental health is particularly important right now for children and young people. Through a partnership with the WE organization, we've made sure students and teachers have access to learning resources through the WE Schools program that support mental well-being, resiliency, and connectedness. We also offer crisis supports for those students that are involved and have, uh, a, a, are battling mental health and addictions issues uh, for teenagers through our Foundry Community Wellness Hubs and communities right across BC. Recently we invested $3 million more into public libraries to enhance digital literacy, supports and programs, e-books, and to provide another layer of online learning support for families. Schools and classrooms are developing flexible and innovative ways to accommodate the needs of each school community. 
BC is a diverse province. We know that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to continued learning, but all districts and education partners are guided by the same set of four ministry-developed principles in their planning. The first is to ensure a healthy and safe environment for all students, families, and employees in every school setting in BC. The second is to provide the services needed to support children of our essential workers, which is happening now across the province. The third is to support vulnerable students who may need special assistance. And the fourth is to provide cont continuity of educational opportunities for all students. In BC, our government has put a strong focus on vulnerable students and making sure the children of our frontline health workers are supported and, and their children are cared for at school so they can keep helping British Columbians. Schools have also proactively identified supports or accommodations to support learning for students with disabilities. But more needs to be done for this group of learners and we are working with MCFD, school districts and special needs parent advocacy organizations to deliver more help to parents and kids with complex learning needs. School districts and independent schools are now weeks into actively providing learning opportunities for students. Learning is occurring both with and without technology. Districts are making sure families who don't have access to technology are getting the help they need by loaning out their equipment. And to date, more than 23,000 computers and devices are being loaned to students so they can continue their education. School districts have redeployed their IT and computer technicians to provide tech support for families to help uh, remote learning technology in their homes. Our government has worked with internet service providers to ensure families have low-cost internet or created local internet hotspots so free Wi-Fi is available to multiple families in a community or on a First Nations reserve. Where online learning isn't possible, schools are continuing to deliver printed learning packages to students or flash drives with everything a student needs to continue learning at home. We're also seeing some school districts who currently have students coming into school buildings in rural and remote communities where schools are often the most reliable place to access Wi-Fi and social distancing can be managed. I'm heartened by the creative and compassionate stories that we hear every day emerging from BC's school system. School communities uh, across the province work quickly to provide now 75,000 meals delivered to students each week, supporting over 16,000 kids that are otherwise vulnerable and experiencing food insecurity. Teachers, education assistants, administrators, and school support staff are putting together weekly grocery hampers for families, delivering bag lunches to homes or at designated hubs for meal pickup. Just as the Ministry and the Provincial Health Office directed school districts to make sure kids are supported to learn at home, we also immediately directed them to provide in-class supports for essential service worker children. Districts uh, provide the same supports to students with special needs and other vulnerable students who may struggle with learning at home. We've worked with the provincial health officer to clarify that these supports can be provided in a safe manner for both students and staff. There are currently several thousand essential service workers, children in public schools, and districts are working to expand this number each and every day and each and every week. An additional 1,300 students who are the children of essential service workers are being supported in independent schools. School districts have been expanding in-home school learning supports for additional occupations on the province's essential service worker list, including those who work in essential retail jobs. To make sure our schools are safe for these students, we worked with the provincial health officer to develop a set of healthy, uh, health and safety protocols which all school districts have implemented. This includes controlled access to buildings, maintaining physical distancing among staff, and implementing distancing strategies for the students that are in schools. Many sectors in the province are starting to plan for the future, including the education sector. We will continue taking direction from the provincial health officer, from the premier and cabinet on when and how schools would be able to increase the number of students receiving in-class instruction and what a phased approach can look like. Right now, we are working with other ministries and our education partners to develop plans for a number of possible scenarios, including resuming some in-class instruction in a controlled and measured way for the future. Ministry staff are researching and we're contacting other jurisdictions to understand the planning and protocols that have been put in place for a controlled return to in-class instruction. New Zealand, for example, uh, students will go back to school starting tomorrow. We are monitoring and learning 
from places like that and other jurisdictions. This will help us here in British Columbia inform an evidence-based plan for BC which minimizes the risk of COVID-19 transmission when the conditions are appropriate. I want to, there's so many people to thank and I did thank some of them at the outset, uh, but it is really asking people to continue these efforts under very difficult in BC and right around the world. Together our province has made good decisions that have helped contain the spread of COVID-19. Our success in BC thus far has been shaped by being diligent and thoughtful and driven by the science and data constantly assessed by Dr. Bonnie Henry, the PHO and the CDC. She and her team and Minister Dix will be updating BC's pandemic modeling this Friday. It's important for British Columbians to tune in to that update. Today it's essential that we all continue to take the necessary preventative measures to keep ourselves, our families and all British Columbians safe and healthy. We will return to regular school life down the road and that road will be shorter and sooner if we continue to act together and act now with measures to prevent the further spread of COVID-19. First Columbia has had an internationally recognized and world-class education system before the pandemic and we will have a world-class education system on the other side of this pandemic. I want to thank you for tuning in and I want to ask Stephanie uh, to say a few words. Thank you, Minister. I'd swell. I want to see them namu. Entapa, Stephanie Higginson, Sanitsa Nas Nunemo. I've just provided you with a Hulkaminum greeting, which is the language of the lands upon which my own school board, the Nanaimo Ladysmith Public Schools, are situated. I also want to acknowledge that I am grateful to be on the territories of the Kwangwan speaking people of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. On behalf of school trustees everywhere, I want to start by acknowledging and thanking all the students who have had their learning and their lives so deeply impacted by the suspension of in-class instruction and especially to our graduates. Everyone who works in education does so due to a deep love for their students. Your patience and your resilience and your ability to adapt through this difficult time has been an inspiration and I raise my hands to all of you. To the families who are adjusting to this new situation, I extend my gratitude and also my understanding. As a working parent of two young school-aged children myself, I keep reminding myself that I am not my child's teacher, I am their parent. So please don't be too hard on yourself. What you are doing is good enough. Thank you for your patience and your adaptability at this time. And finally, to school and district staff, your willingness and flexibility to adapt to this new reality is a huge part of the province's success in fighting this public health crisis. I raise my hands to those working so hard to meet the diverse needs of students in this current context and thank you for your willingness to be adaptable and nimble during this time. Your ability to adapt is what has and will continue to make educational programming in this evolving context work for the students of British Columbia. I would like to assure people about the deep and meaningful collaboration between the Ministry of Education and the entire education sector in navigating the, uh, these uncharted waters together. The Ministry's support in providing protocols and guidelines for each district has allowed every Board of Education to work towards meeting the unique needs of their communities in a culturally, socially and geographically relevant way. The Ministry's efforts are appreciated by every board in the province. This support has been and continues to be integral in ensuring the continuity of learning to students. This health crisis has highlighted the important part that the public education system plays in a well-functioning society. Boards of education across the province are working to fill gaps in need for the families they serve beyond just the delivery of curriculum. As we heard from the Minister, we are seeing district food programs adapt and adjust to ensure that students who only get a healthy meal at school continue to have access to healthy food. I am heartened and at times emotional at the effort of student support teachers and educational assistants to adjust their service delivery for some
school day. Trustees for boards of education across British Columbia have long known the important role that public schools play beyond the delivery of curriculum. The ability for each board to pivot and meet these fundamental and diverse needs under challenging circumstances is a testament to how much we all care for our students. Equity is a foundational pillar of our public education system and this crisis took us off course. It is also important to focus on the tremendous job that people across the system are doing in delivering curriculum to students and their families. Examples include teachers hosting virtual story times, sharing virtual dance lessons, and even virtual band practices. Educational assistants doing social emotional check-ins with students using online group and video chats. Staff and community members working together to ensure vulnerable students who rely on a myriad of school-based support programs continue to receive the supports they need. I know that there may be some gaps as we reconfigure the school system to keep our students our employees and their families safe. And if you as a parent or a caregiver have concerns, then contact your child's teacher or principal. Many normal school functions are still operating and your child's teacher and principal want to make sure that they are meeting the needs of every student. Schooling doesn't look the same as it did before and nor should it, but your child's learning team are still there to support them and you. I want to reassure everyone impacted by the suspension of in-class instruction that throughout this crisis, the ministry, in collaboration with the entire education sector, has taken a measured approach to ensure the health safe, and safety of students, families, and employees under the direction of our provincial health officer. Going forward, whatever the future holds, each Board of Education will respond to direction from the Provincial Health Officer and the Ministry of Education in a way that will meet the unique needs of the communities they serve. That is our job and we will do it with the health and safety of our students, our staff, our families and our communities at the core of every decision we make. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we'll take questions now. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. Uh, you are limited to one question. Feel free to re-queue up. If we have time, we will get to you. Please unmute your phones. You will not be audible until we call your name. First question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Coming. Once there is a vaccine for this uh, virus, will it be required that every student uh, that is medically eligible have the vaccine before going to a BC school? Well, I truly hope that we can discuss uh, such a problem as having a vaccine and uh, how to implement it uh, down the road. And I hope that comes sooner than what many experts are predicting around the world. Uh, but I think that uh, in terms of a, a public health program around vaccination, um, that is going to be something that has to be widespread in order to be effective in British Columbia. It will need to address uh, British Columbians of all ages. The school system can effectively deliver uh, vaccination programs as we do uh, for other diseases currently. Next question is from Rob Buffum, CTV. Oh, hi. I'm just wondering if I, I know you can't give us a specific date, but Quebec yesterday announced mid-May would be a date for back to school. Uh, you mentioned New Zealand. I'm wondering if you can um, tell us, uh, Minister Fleming, you know, what the likelihood of kids being back in the classroom before the end of this school year is. And on a related note, I guess, whenever it happens, have, has consideration been given to things like testing teachers for COVID when, whenever students do get back into the classroom? Yeah, I would say in terms of the planning, the bulk of the work right now is really around the health and safety protocols, both for staff and students. Uh, we have some in place right now, but those are for uh, very, very limited numbers of people in a school building. And if we're going to... Uh, not flick a switch and start up the school system, but uh, begin to uh, dial up the number of uh, people uh, in, in schools, uh, we're going to have to update those protocols. So there are a lot of discussions happening about uh, what it would look like in addition to uh, potential timelines. I think um, perhaps we have an advantage uh, of being able to look at other jurisdictions who, uh, for their own reasons, have announced uh, dates and returns to school that, that we have not done so uh, thus far in BC. Uh, we're in constant contact with uh, other provinces and territories 
in the country and uh, and as I mentioned in my remarks uh, the ministry is uh, contacting and researching uh, what jurisdictions are doing in other parts of the world but we we do uh, have the benefit here of having an internationally recognized uh, Center for Disease Control uh, public health uh, officer and uh, agency that has been uh, working extremely well uh, keeping British Columbians safe and uh, their input, their guidance uh, is crucial. Karen Larson, CDC. Okay, moving on, Lisa Houston, News 1130. Minister Fleming, speaking about how many kids are in schools now, can you illuminate for us, like, how many kids are in schools across the province of essential workers, what it's looking like? Are they sitting in classrooms? Are they all separate rooms? Are teachers wearing masks when they're around them? We're just wondering what it looks like now, so maybe we have an image of what comes ahead and looking at what numbers are in there now. Yeah, it's a fairly small number. As I said, it's just several thousand on a regular school population, in, in the public school system anyway, of about 550,000. Uh, students. It's mostly in elementary school settings. It's it's the younger children that uh, can't be home alone. Uh, that their parents, who are nurses or uh, frontline uh, healthcare workers, uh, they they need the school system to be able to report to work to uh, save lives and treat British Columbians. So um, very small numbers, uh, varies by district, uh, but um, you know, we we hope to expand that because. As we've learned uh, during this pandemic, uh, there are a lot of crucially important uh, points in our economy that uh, help sustain all of us if we're to get through this together. Uh, so there are other uh, tiers of essential workers who are involved now in the school system. We expect those numbers uh, will grow in the, uh, in the coming weeks because uh, it's necessary to do so to support uh, the economic activity we have and also the, the prime directive around uh, maintaining a, uh, a highly functioning uh, healthcare system. Next question is from Mary Griffin, Czech News. Well, hi, Minister. Thanks so much for this. I was just wondering, you mentioned that um, BC is not opening uh, despite Quebec is reopening to some extent at school. Can you give us the specifics on what um, led to the decision not to, I, because I know there are several thousand kids in school now, but why not um, widen the number of kids back in school? What specifically did you look at that led you to the decision we're not opening up the classes more? Uh, well, we haven't come to a decision. What we're working on, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is really focusing on the planning so that when we do, uh, uh, and if and when we do, announce that, for example, before the end of this school year, uh, we have that right. We have uh, a completed plan. I think a couple of other jurisdictions have um, uh, sort of put setting a date uh, ahead of uh, establishing and developing a comprehensive and safe plan. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that's backwards. I think what we're doing is working with all of the education stakeholders, working with the provincial health office to really have a tight health and safety protocol that will consider all of the sorts of questions that you would imagine uh, are being asked around PPE, around hand washing stations, around um, you know how you schedule children, what percentage of them should return, is it is it a limited reentry? Uh, all of those things are part of the planning process that we're uh, that we're undergoing right now in BC. But I, I want to reiterate: at the end of the day, it's the science and the data of how we're combating uh, COVID-19 that will determine what is safe and what is the right thing to do. So. Uh, I, I appreciate the role the media has played in, in reporting uh, the uh, regular updates uh, and the very transparent information that the government of BC has disclosed around our modeling in this province. And uh, the Premier and, and Cabinet, as well as uh, a number of sectors in BC, are talking about a more general reopening because economic hardship is a reality in BC. Uh, so when we look at you know evolving health and safety protocols, we're not talking just about the school system, although there's an intense amount of focus there. And society wide. Next question is from Tina Lovegreen, CBC. Hi, Minister. Um, can you confirm whether or not teachers, admin staff, or support staff will be wearing PPE when they resume in class instruction with students? and whether districts are looking to buy PPE now? I can say that districts have uh, some PPE um, in terms of 
not mandatory. That is not part of the protocol uh, at this point. But as I say, when we're planning for um, a greater number of students uh, and staff uh, in a school building, the health and safety protocol will evolve uh, with that. So those are, those are questions that are uh, under active discussion right now. Um, the reason we're planning is, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's prudent. We know full well that we might not be able to implement those plans, uh, you know, this side of summer break, plans around how to deliver uh, summer school education opportunities as well, because we know there will be some demand for that. So those are things that are under active discussion, if I can put it that way. Next question is from Jane Side, North Shore News. Uh, yes, my, my question, uh, I guess, follows on from that. I'm just wondering, um, you know, what kind of um, anticipation do you have for sort of more more general students to be back in the classroom, given that most parents aren't going to really be able to be back uh, working um, in the economy until there's some provision back in school? Mm -hmm. That's true, and, and again, BC has had fewer economic restrictions but more successful social distancing strategies than other jurisdictions. Similarly, our school system has not been completely closed, as I mentioned in this briefing. We have always continued some in-class instruction services, where uh, today's update was, was, was in part to tell you that we hope to additionally expand that to help uh, more parents uh, of vulnerable kids or those with complex learning need to simply are having a tougher time and uh, exacerbating inequities around learning opportunities because the remote learning technologies don't particularly work for them. So that's something that school districts are uh, helping and rallying to, uh, to provide uh, those additional services. So I think you're going to see the focus for the next uh, while, I like say the next few weeks, uh, being on uh, continuing to serve those students who are in classes, whether they're the children of essential service workers or uh, more uh, 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 learners that have uh, special learning needs. Next, we have Keith Baldry. Thanks uh, for this, Minister. Uh, I hear a lot from teachers, I'm sure you do, and everybody on this phone line hears from them, who are concerned about their personal safety. Uh, and given that we don't know everything about this virus yet, it's presented itself in different ways in different people. There was a story out of the UK yesterday of a bunch of kids under the age of 12 really getting sick with this. So is it actually, are you convinced it's actually safe to open the schools to for teachers and kids? And secondly, when you do reopen, are teachers able to not go? They can choose to stay home and not, uh, not, not attend class. Well, I'm convinced that the um, school services we have today in schools are absolutely safe and that the protocols that were developed are, are thorough and they're working. It's really about contemplating what the next steps might be. And, um, and that will uh, involve Uh, uh, regimes around uh, uh, regular cleaning and how kids uh, look after themselves and uh, physically distance. It's probably going to be difficult for uh, kids of a certain age to uh, strictly adhere to that. Um, but as I've, as I've said uh, uh, in recent days and again today, we are going to have to have a made in BC approach that uh, acknowledges and learns from other jurisdictions but is based on how we're doing as a province, how how we are fighting to not just contain COVID, but uh, to eradicate it. And uh, we are making significant process, uh, pro progress. We're, we're in a good position relative to other places. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we need to continue to do some more planning. And we will, of course, we'll be talking with uh, employee groups. We have uh, involved uh, all of the stakeholders, including uh, unions in the education system around uh, if and when uh, a return to school is going to happen, uh, what it needs to look like to maintain uh, their absolute protection and put their safety first. Next question is from Moira Witten, the TAI. Hi, Minister. I have a follow-up to that um, from my colleague. But budget, some budget cuts have made it so that some schools don't have daytime cleaners right now, hot water, soap and washrooms. How are you planning to keep schools clean um, to be safe with these issues? I'm going, to, I'm going to let Stephanie Higginson take a question here. I think this might be a good one for her. Just, just a moment. Thanks, Minister. You know, we 
this entire process taken uh, a measured approach that's based in science. So if we are able to get to a place where we can reopen schools to a larger number of students than are currently being served in them, because it's important to remember that schools aren't closed, then we will, all, we will ensure the health and safety of students and employees and their families are able to be met when we open those schools up to a larger amount of students. Along, we have been making sure that every decision that we make uh, at the local level and also in response to decisions that are being made at the provincial level, that we are able to make sure that we keep the health and safety of students, families, and employees at the core of every decision we make. So we will make sure that schools can operate under health and safety guidelines and protocols that are provided by the provincial health office. Next question is from Lisa. designation but those that experience hunger regularly and rely on schools in normal times and the and uh, we'll go up and our government support will be there along with the business community and the voluntary sector that are rallied to provide those kinds of supports what I did reference earlier was that there are there's lots of low incidence uh, kids who have uh, an individual education plan uh, uh, for to guide them that don't need um, you know face to face in class instruction. What we're finding though is that there are some kids who do need you know speech and language pathologists and other specialist teachers that do need some kind of limited presence in schools, and we have that. You know sometimes it's for an hour or two a day. Uh, there are also some parents who. And I, I completely um, can understand the frustration and their exhaustion. They need some respite, and the school system needs to be there for them. And we're encouraging districts uh, to keep doing what they're doing in the case of, of those that are providing really good levels of support and others uh, to enhance their levels of support for uh, families and students like that. John Crawford, CFTK Terrace. Yes, uh, Minister, thank you very much for, for taking the question. Um, you mentioned earlier the inequities uh, that may be existing between in-class uh, instruction that some kids are getting right now and uh, the remote education that a lot of kids are getting. And I'm thinking of people in uh, my area, which is, uh, you know, as you know, a lot of uh, communities in this area don't have the Internet service that, say, the city would. So these kids might be falling further and further behind and is there a concern that at some point they get so far behind that it becomes a permanent problem and they'll never catch it? Uh, how can that be addressed? Yeah. Well, a couple things, and I'll let Stephanie answer this as well from her, her perspective. Um, we have uh, been working really hard to expand uh, the uh, ability to provide uh, good, fast uh, connectivity, Internet service in communities that have been underserved. Our partners, uh, TELUS and Shaw, have been doing a fantastic job expanding those um, those services. There are some kids and families uh, who live in very, very remote locations in BC uh, who are being served by a, a paper-based or flash drive uh, type uh, uh, delivery of, of, of learning materials and they use the phone to connect with their teachers. So um, I mentioned earlier that you know there's a lot of very useful uh, learning going on that doesn't involve uh, uh, particularly sophisticated technology but we do want to uh, expand, uh, you know, video conferencing opportunities and other online resources and apps that teachers can use. I know that the teaching profession is is very peer driven, and there's a, a lot of uh, uh, social media out there and, and ways that teachers interact with one another, where they're passing on uh, really good suggestions. We want to create this culture of best practice. Like nobody would, in their right mind, would ever devise uh, a system of you know continuous online learning. It's the best we can do because it's the safest thing we can do. Um, we didn't want to be one of those jurisdictions that just closed schools and threw up their hands and said, you know, so much for learning, we'll get back to you later. We wanted to provide continuous ongoing learning opportunities, and we've done that. I think it's wise to try and get better and better and more sophisticated at it, at it because as we have heard from health experts around the world, including our own, 
you know, there could be a second wave in the fall. We could get back to school and then have a disruption. Uh, it makes sense to invest in getting uh, better and better at what we're doing, and that means uh, a connectivity with rural communities. And uh, Citizen Services is another ministry that's assisting and making sure that internet service is available to all British communities, no matter where they live. Thank you. I think, uh, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but the question is important, pointing out the, the, the risk of inequity and the gaps of inequity widening under our current context. And I think that you've, um, you've shone a light on one of the reasons why it is important that if and, if and when we can start expanding services to students, we need to, we need to do that. Uh, however, I would also say that I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, be super concerned that students are going to fall so far behind that it is too late because what we also have in BC is the best teaching professionals in the world who will respond to the needs of the students when they are able to see the students in front of them. Every year in September, teachers um, evaluate and assess the students for where they're at and they design their learning according to where they're at. And I think what we are doing at the local level is starting to plan for some type of professional development that will allow teachers to adjust their, their teaching so that they can um, they can meet the needs of the students who, who come to them in September, perhaps having had a long gap in their instruction. Next question is from Rob Monroe, Info News. Hi, Minister. Um, we're getting a lot of um, pushback from parents who are just overwhelmed by this. Uh, we have one that has two preteens, and they're on Zoom a few times a day in apps and um, all, all these kinds of things. Is there any thought, um, particularly with the younger ages, to have just, you know, as, as you say, throw up your hands and say, give them a break? and um, started then in the fall so the parents who are trying to work and working from home and all these sorts of things uh, can you know keep their mental health yeah i mean i think i think the um the teaching guideline and, and some of the planning documents that the ministry uh, designed in collaboration with uh, the school sector um, you know first of all the message is, is parents need to give themselves a break they, they, they really should uh, not try and replicate being a teacher, but there are lots of resources that we've provided on our Keep Learning site and elsewhere that will give lots of useful tips to helping them work with their kids. But I think it's important with young children to uh, be in touch with teachers, uh, however that may be organized, whether it's through video conferencing or if that's not possible, teachers are doing it in other ways through email and over the phone. But to get resources into the hands of young kids just to keep at it in terms of reading and writing comprehension and um, and mathematics and those kinds of things but to be able to schedule that is that is reasonable make sure your kid is getting outdoors and staying healthy and exer exercising and you know don't try and layer too much on I, I think we've heard from enough parents that that doesn't necessarily work or it certainly doesn't reduce their anxiety levels but you know, you're hearing very uneven reports. Of, you're even hearing of, about some kids really thriving under the new technologies and environment and, and, and teachers really stepping up and doing a fantastic job. I, I say nobody would design this school system intentionally, but given where we're at and what we need to do to keep continuous learning happening, uh, there's some amazing examples in British Columbia that are really drawing inspiration. Maria, oh, are you going to speak? Sorry. So I'm going to empathize with those parents you're hearing from because I'm one of them and you know in a moment of COVID confessions I completely lost the plot on my nine-year-old yesterday and um, I think it's really important as the minister said for those parents to you know give themselves a break uh, remember that what you're doing is good enough and and sometimes our children are this is happening to them too uh, and my nine-year-old reminds me of that sometimes in ways that I, I don't actually see until about three hours later. And then I remember while he's acting the way he is. So, you know, I, I understand that this is um, very difficult for parents, uh, whether you are working or not working, because if you are not working, then perhaps you're also very concerned about your family's financial well-being. So I would say to them that sometimes it's okay to have the kids go outside and play baseball with them and find other ways to encourage their learning that isn't necessarily uh, the traditional way that you expect from them uh, when they're in school. We have developed a nightly game of 500 up in my house where the kids are doing math by catching the baseball and wrestling with each other and it seems to work. So it's, it's, but you've also hit on another reason why at some point when we are able to, uh, these are good reasons for us to think about 
ways that we can provide services to more students in the buildings in a way that is safe when and if possible. Next question is from Maria Teal, Campbell River Mirror. Hi there. I'm wondering, uh, in a phased approach, what would the next groups of students returning to the classroom be? Um, I think in some of our initial planning and looking at what other jurisdictions are doing, you, you do have a different approach for, say, um, primary school aged children, middle, middle school aged kids, and, uh, and high school and uh, senior high school students. Um, so, you know, in terms of the amount of time they need to be in the building, the, obviously the older kids get, the better they're, they are able to handle, um, you know, primarily online driven uh, uh, solutions. And they also tend to study in much larger buildings in elementary schools. So it's really a, it's really a, a, a planning exercise that, that balances what's going to be effective in terms of uh, returning to in-class instruction, what's going to be meaningful in a day or half day if, if that's the case. Uh, and also, uh, and, and primarily, uh, it is guided by what is healthy, what is safe to do. So um, that's why I say uh, the, the work on updating uh, health and safety protocols is, is really where we start on contemplating a, a possible uh, return to in-class instruction. We have time for one more question. Uh, Maria Rantanen, Richmond News. Okay, I think that wraps it up. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much.